Hey, all Scott here, hawking stickers for the back of your truck. They've got some great ones at LibertyStickers.com. Get your son killed, Jeb Bush 2016, FDR, no longer the worst president in American history, the National Security Agency, blackmailing your congressman since 1952, and USA. Sometimes we back Al-Qaeda, sometimes we don't. And there's over a thousand other great ones on the wars, police, state, elections, the Federal Reserve, and more at LibertyStickers.com. They'll take care of all your custom printing for your band or your business at TheBumperSticker.com. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else is Suck. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton, this is my show. Hey, I keep forgetting to mention, I finally got the uh, Amazon thingamajig up and running where if you want to go and buy your books by way of my site, I'll get a cut. So you know how that works with uh, the anti-war bookstore, LewRockwell.com, or a lot of people have an affiliate program there with Amazon. Doesn't raise your price any, it just means I get a cut of what you spend at Amazon.com, so... If you do all your Christmas shopping or anything like that on Amazon.com, uh, if you go to scotthorton.org and you look in the right-hand margin, then you will see a big Amazon.com logo. Click on that, and then anything that you buy after that, uh, I'll get a little bit of a kickback, and then I can get Christmas presents for people that I like, too. Wouldn't that be cool? All right, so scotthorton.org, just look in the uh, right-hand margin there. For the link. Also, you can find it on my Facebook page, too, if you want. All right. Anyway, so now we get to talk with Jason Leopold, uh, intrepid reporter on the Guantanamo Beat, mostly these days. And he is writing for Al Jazeera America, and that is America.AlJazeera.com. Welcome back to the show, Jason. How are you doing? Doing well, Scott. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, good to have you here. And uh, so you just got back from Guantanamo Bay, right? How long were you there? I was there for a week. I was there last week, <clears throat> just returned on uh, Saturday, and uh, I was basically down there uh, to uh, check out the facilities again, take another uh, prison tour, um, and uh, you know speak with some of the uh, the new military personnel who were recently deployed there in October, um, also to get a sort of uh, insight and uh, as as much as possible into the you know, the, what, what the state of affairs is with regard to a hunger strike. Yeah, well, and you got a lot of great journalism here at uh, america.aljazeera.com. I want to tell people about here. Um, we've got Marooned at Guantanamo. We've got New Guantanamo Commander Supports Closing Facility. Uh, Gitmo Media Blackout Hopes to Undermine Hunger Strikers. And uh, Gitmo Officials Change Procedures for hunger strikes, force feeding, and of course, yeah, as just referred to, uh, the process for disclosing uh, what's going on with the hunger strike behind the scenes. You want to start with that? And, and there's also a, a story up there uh, about uh, you know some of the some of the items you could buy at the gift shop at Guantanamo, and oh, yeah. uh, the sort of whole surreal experience about uh, you know hearing uh, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville as I'm uh, traveling over to uh, the prison. Well, you know what? I don't want to spend too much time on that, but actually I think it is probably uh, kind of important to set the scene about what you call the surreal nature of the Guantanamo base surrounding this notorious prison. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a, I probably mentioned this to you before, but, you know, Guantanamo is, uh, you know, it's an active naval base. It's 45 square miles, resembles a small town. And in fact, uh, you know, the prison itself is on a far corner of the island uh, in a real desolate area. Uh, it's uh, not accessible to uh, anyone who works there unless you have a you know specific clearance. So you can't just sort of hey, say, "Hey, I'm going to drive over to the prison side." Um, you know, but the rest of Guantanamo, it's just sort of uh, you know the folks that are there on the Navy side, just sort of go about their business and seem to forget and are oblivious to the fact that you know you have this prison there. I mean, during the week that I was there, they were preparing for Christmas, so you have this. Uh, you know, it's a big Christmas tree as you're driving up sort of the main road. Uh, these uh, holiday lights that say Seasons Greetings from Guantanamo Bay. Uh, you know, uh, gingerbread houses, gingerbread, you know, gingerbread Santa Claus, you know, Frosty the Snowman out, you know, out there. And so it's, it's just surreal because, you know, you are at Guantanamo. And then, of course, you know, you go into the gift shop and every T-shirt that they have uh, there, uh, you know, describing Guant Guantanamo as this coastal paradise. Um, they did have one T-shirt that said, uh, you know, Joint Task Force Guantanamo um, detainee operations, you know, Operation Enduring Freedom. So, 
Um, it's I'm not sure who would wear such a shirt, but uh, um, you know they, they have a T-shirt commemorating the fact that uh, they do have a prison there. Well, and listen, I mean, you got to admit it all is very normal now. I mean, there was a time where that was sort of the, all of what you're describing there would be the no, the most normal thing about it, as though you know somehow that that kind of fake hometown feeling that they build up around it is is meant to try to force a feeling of normalization about what's actually taking place but at this point it's worked i think and <laughs> it is all very normal not because of the town that they built up there or, or uh, that already existed there to a great degree i understand but um not because of that but just because it's been so long that we've had this you know, more or less legal black hole. I mean, you couldn't really consider the laws that they've passed legalizing this after the fact to be legit, I don't think, you know? It's all Yeah, no, you're ad-hoc. absolutely right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's been, it, it's been 12 years. January will be 12 years since the first prisoners were, you know, were brought to Guantanamo. And, in fact, this month marks uh, 12 years, actually, since uh, uh, when John Yu, uh, the former uh, Justice Department uh, Office of Legal Counsel, attorney wrote a memo actually to the defense department uh more or less uh explaining why guantanamo was uh, the best place to hold uh you know so-called enemy combatants and uh, essentially you know he said it's outside of the law they won't uh they won't have a right to habeas corpus so you know he was proved wrong years later but you know many anniversaries coming up and uh you know just the fact uh, uh as i indicated you know being there um you don't expect to get much when you're there, Scott, but it's, uh, you know, it's important. I wanted to talk to the medical staff. I uh, really wanted to, you know, get a, 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 an opportunity to, you know, once again, see the facilities. I, I was able to observe some, uh, you know, some prisoners in the compliant camp, you know, which they call Camp 6. Uh, that's the camp where you have to eat food, and if you don't eat food, you get sent over to Camp 5, which is uh, the non-compliant camp. You know, it, 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 it's always amazing to me to sort of take a walk through these you know, through these, uh, through through the uh, cell blocks, and and there's no, you know, they they brought me through a cell block where there's no, you know, there, it wasn't an active cell block, no prisoners there are there, uh, but you you know, looking at the cells that they have spent, you know, 12 years in, um, nearly 12 years, most of them, it's uh, it, it's it's unbelievable. You but know, then they what, still uh, wouldn't let you anywhere near any of the detainees at all. Well, they actually did. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I was standing outside of, um, or I was facing, uh, you know, some of the prisoners behind a one-way glass. So I was able to, you know, observe them in Camp Six, uh, in this communal block, as they were, you know, watching television, eating lunch. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Breakfast. You say that they got headphones on. That means they're watching TV. They're plugged into the thing. Right. So, um, so I did get to see them. And, and I'll tell you, you know, many of them, look they just look old. They look old. They look weak. Um, I tried to really sort of study their faces to see if I could, uh, you know, figure out who's who. Uh, that was that was difficult because, you know, they're obviously moving around. And uh, it's, you know, it, it, uh, having the opportunity to speak to some of the guards, you know, one guard telling me that, uh, you know, he's ready to go home. He wants to get the heck out of there. Uh, Guantanamo's not for him. You know, the staff is constantly sort of emphasizing uh, how, uh, you know, the challenges that they face, uh, you know, trying to impress upon me. I was the only media there that week, by the way. Uh, but they're trying to impress upon me that the, uh, you know, they're constantly splashing them and assaulting the guard force with, uh, you know, a, a cocktail of uh, feces, urine. It's, uh, you know, it, it, and then just trying to get an idea of what, you know, what the operations are like, what the hunger strike has been like, what, whether... Uh, there's an ongoing hunger strike. Those were the difficult questions. Those were the questions that I just could not get an answer to. You know, and speaking with the, um, even with the medical staff, I mean, they just spoke in clinical terms, you know, calling it um, an e-feeding. I, I actually have not heard that before, e-feeding, uh, as opposed to forest feeding. Uh, hunger strike was self-fast, um, and, uh, you know, and they're unconcerned about the criticism that, uh, you know, ethical groups have, um, laid out, you know, with regard to the force feeding. But I will tell you that, you know, while there's these discussions taking place here in the U.S. about um, uh, about Guantanamo and whether or not it will be closed, and we just saw, as a matter of fact, um, you know, two prisoners were released over the weekend. Right as I was leaving, you know, apparently they released two prisoners. 
uh, back to Saudi Arabia. There's no discussion like that at Guantanamo, Scott. So everyone there is, they, they won't discuss the possibility of the, you know, the prison closing down. Uh, they'll only say, you know, we're focused on the mission. We're focused on the mission. In fact, in that story where I've got sort of the photographs there with the T-shirts, I picked up while I was there, you know, one of these smart cards um, that the public relations staff carries around. And basically, it, uh, it, you know, it, uh, I, I'm able to understand now why certain questions aren't answered because it, in this, on the smart card, it, it contains all the talking points. Um, you know, what can be talked about uh, and what cannot be uh, discussed with the media. So um, it was certainly surreal being there. I think it was, you know, again, it, it, you know, it's just important. Um, and, uh, you know, having the opportunity to sort of, uh, you know, be a bit aggressive in, in my reporting, trying to get the... Uh, trying to get some questions asked, answered. And, you know, for example, as you know, they recently withheld, uh, they're, they're no longer providing the media with a, um, with a figure of, of how many prisoners are on hunger strike. Mm-hmm. And I was able to at least get them to admit that the reason they're not doing that is, or anymore is because the, uh, you know, the prisoners were very successful in attracting media attention, which was ultimately the main goal, you know, to try to raise awareness about a hunger strike. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I don't particularly see anything wrong with that. Um, you know, with, with trying to get media attention. But the fact that they did, uh, you know, attract so much attention, now they're withholding those numbers. Right, and they're pretty honest about that anyway, right? That Well, see, it was yeah, working, so we had to stop it. Yes, yeah. yeah, they were uh, they're very forthcoming. You know, the, um, the head of public affairs who I spoke with there, Commander John Philistrat, said, you know, it's a self-perpetuating story. Uh, we don't want to feed into that. We don't want to give them an opportunity to sort of, uh, uh, we don't want to help them attract the media attention by giving me or anyone else uh, any figures about the number of hunger strikers right. uh, because you know they felt that you know what happens what will what will you know what will you do with that information well you'll go out and you'll write a story and uh, that story will just you know it will just uh, constantly every day we'll hear about the number of hunger strikers and you know yeah. it, it, it's so funny because they claim you know one of the taglines there is uh, transparency uh, safe, humane, legal, transparent. That's the actual tagline of uh, Joint Task Force Guantanamo Operation, mm-hmm. um, or the motto. And uh, they've, they've been anything but transparent. You know, one of the things, if you'll notice in some of these pictures I took, um, you're not allowed to shoot, you're not allowed to take photographs of anyone's faces. So I could not take a photograph, except unless they give you permission. Um, so I was not able to take a, pho- uh, a picture of, uh, you know, for example, the, uh, the head of uh, um, the hospital, or the officer in charge of the you know detainee hospital uh, showing his face. He did allow me to use his name. So after, and I also was able to, to speak to a guard uh, who allowed me to uh, use his name and, and um, photograph him. But after I left, I found out that they implemented, literally when I left, Scott, I mean, I'm still on the plane, back to the U.S., they implemented a new policy now that no one can speak on the record or have their picture taken, even if they volunteer um, because of the fear that, uh, uh, you know, uh, security concerns that something can happen to them or their families by being associated with uh, prison operations. Yeah, well, they're just proje- projecting their guilt, and that's kind of understandable. <laughs> right, yeah. Putting these guys and you know, make, I mean, in a sense, th- there's a, at least a kernel of truth there, right, that they're putting these guys in danger like that. Now, so um, the numbers, I think you said in the article, uh, there, are, you believe you are led to believe there are 29 uh, people who are still hunger striking now. Basically, correct? Well, that's actually the figure that comes from Shocker Amr, who is the last, um, you know, the last uh, UK prisoner still in Guantanamo. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, during the hunger strike, uh, what was uh, happening all year? I mean, basically, we received our information about, you know, what, uh, what, how, at first, how many uh, prisoners were on hunger strike from the attorneys who received it from the prisoners. So once it got to the point where, you know, that they were sort of driving, you know, the, the news cycle by, uh, you know, that, that's when the Guantanamo officials stepped in. So um, once they stopped reporting those numbers, um, you know, Shocker Amr spoke to his attorney, Clive Stafford Smith, uh, of Reprieve, and, and, and said that they're, you know, the Guantanamo hunger strike is back on. And there's now, uh, you know, 29, you know, prisoners um, on uh, on hunger strike, and uh, 
uh, you know, 19 being four steps. Yeah. Well, and you know, I don't know um, if maybe this is kind of beyond your purview as a journalist about this, um, but uh, you may have an opinion. It seems like, in a sense, they're really asking for the right to commit suicide here. And when you talk to the doctor in your article, his thing is, hey, man, I only have one job, and that is keeping them healthy. And any other consideration about why it is that they're choosing starving themselves to death as a form of protest or whatever, that's beyond their purview to even think about. That's that's just not even a question. But that's really the right that that this officer is denying them is their right to go that far in trying to make their point about being held indefinitely without charges like this, correct? Exactly, yes. I mean, that's, uh, you know, you, you, you've nailed it. And, and it's, uh, you know, as I indicated, you know, taking a look at these cells, which are, you know, 10 by 7, I believe. Um, I mean, Scott, there, you know, some of these cells, there, you know, there aren't any windows in there. You know, the lights are either very bright, very dim. It's a climate-controlled setting, you know, it's... Uh, you know, and to be told over and over that, yeah, you've been cleared for release, but we're never going to release you. You're going to die right. here, too. <laughs> right. You so haven't been charged uh, with any crime, much less convicted of one, but we're still not. Oh, and we agree with you that you never did anything, but we're still not letting you go. Right. And if we do let you go, you know, you're going to have to go to a rehab center, even though we never, you know, we, we were never able to prove you did anything. All right. So, yeah. I Hold mean, it right there, uh, Jason. we got to take this break, unfortunately. Sure. But we'll be right back, everybody, with... Jason Leopold, right after this, go to america.aljazeera.com. He's got a great series here from his recent trip down to Guantanamo Bay. More like this on the other side of the break. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show. I'm talking with Jason Leopold. He's now writing for america.aljazeera.com. And uh, just back from Guantanamo Bay, he's got, what, five or six... Uh, very important stories here, and uh, uh, can we talk a minute? We're we're uh, well, we're talking about the uh, the force feeding and the the uh, uh, protest by suicide here. It occurs to me yeah. that uh, maybe some of these guys, if they knew that they were really uh, that the Americans would let them actually starve themselves all the way to death, they might start eating anyway. Right? It becomes easier for them to protest when they know that they're not really going to die of it. But then again, it seems like it should be up to them uh, to decide that, considering the situation that they're in, you know? Sure. I think that, uh, look, I think that a hunger strike in general is, you know, is aimed at trying to attract attention and to raise awareness. And that's certainly what this hunger strike did. I don't believe that, you know, these prisoners were just, you know, deciding not to eat. Perhaps some of them were just, you know, so they can, so they can die. Uh, I, I think well, that I'm saying it's going to take you know, that is. to make their point because the Ameri nothing short of that is going to do it. I'm afraid. Well, exactly. I think that uh, you know there there probably are some that would look. You know, they don't have the ability. Apparently, even though one last year is said to have uh, you know overdosed, um, but it, it it is the only control that they have over their you know or one would think over their bodies. But now we're basically seeing. Well, no, actually, it isn't. So, um, you know, the hunger strike was hugely successful, Scott, in, in, in raising awareness and getting President Obama to actually note it during a major counterterrorism speech. Uh, it probably, you know, resulted, it, it, it's probably the reason that we've seen, you know, the results of, uh, of uh, you know, renewed efforts to attempt to close the prison. It, uh, there's no question in my mind, at least, that, you know, the hunger strike is what uh, ultimately led this administration to, uh, you know, release, uh, I think it's about four or five prisoners in the past, uh, you know, month or two. It's still very slow. So, you know, as a form of protest, as, a, as what it was originally intended, um, it, uh, it succeeded. You know, at this point, I think that, uh, you know, that or, or, or if there was a change in policy where, you know, suddenly they were uh, allowed to starve themselves to death, Sure, I think maybe some of them would, um, you know, would start eating again. But I also think that there are some that would, you know, you'd see mass deaths there as a result. Uh, and how would that look? So uh, we know that's never going to happen, Scott. They're, they're never going to allow that to happen. Yeah. Well, and then the alternative is torturing them, basically. I mean, I think it's interesting the way in your interview 
uh, he goes to great pains. The I guess doctor or officer of some t- of some type there uh, goes to great lengths to try to explain that. Oh, when it comes to uh, cramming the tube down their throat and force feeding them, they're all very submissive and compliant, and we use olive oil, and they seem to really like that. And I'm, so I'm we try to take the torture it, out of the force feeding, but it is in right, essence exactly. a pretty severe process, right? It is. I mean, it's, uh, and, and I asked that question last time I was there in May, and, uh, you know, the doctor was very, the, the senior medical officer, that's how I was only able to refer to him, I mean, he was very upset, very uh, very defensive, you know, to, to, uh, uh, at any suggestion that this was, you know, that this was torture. And, you know, the, the, the doctor, or rather the nurse um, who I spoke with, who, who mentioned the olive oil, and it's, uh, um, you know, had, had said to me that, you know, this is, this is a procedure that he's done dozens of times, you know, in, in the U.S. at hospitals. And I said to him, so what's the difference? You know, I, I was hoping that he would sort of, you know, he, he was saying, well, it's not really, you know, any difference. But, you know, in, in a hospital setting where someone needs to be force-fed, you know, they're not going against their will. Um, it's, uh, it's perhaps they're, you know, they're having digestive issues or, or whatever the medical issues are that, you know, require them to have a tube, you know, snake down their you know, into their nose, down to their stomach. Here, you know, it's it, it clearly is different, and, and yet they just would not, um, could not sort of see that. Although the senior medical officer this time around did say, well, they do sort of resist when they're being placed into the restraint chair, um, but yeah, you know, then they'll accept it once they're in there. It's you know, it's it's odd. It's uh, it, it, how do we even react to that? And then again, where. You know the doctors are saying, you know, this is you know we're we're just focusing on the mission, we're just following orders. Um, that's uh, it's you know that, that's I, I don't even think it's the new normal. It's just what's normal at Guantanamo, you know. Uh, right. And uh, it's it, it is. You know, it's, it's like the it's, KFC it's a, a mile world. away. Is exactly what it is. This is just how we do business. Same as always. To them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, and then the other problems here, though. Um, as I indicated in that same story, Scott, is that, you know, you have now prisoners who um, who, who are aging, you know, and then this indefinite detention, solitary confinement, hunger strikes. I mean, it's taking a toll on their, not just their mental health and physical health, uh, but it's it's resulting in, you know, in serious ailments. So, you know, last week when I was there, you know, two prisoners were um, getting ready to undergo cataract surgery. You know, the, and they had to fly in you know, a physician to perform the surgery because we still have a provision in the National Defense Authorization Act that says that they cannot come to the U.S., even come to the U.S. Um, for, you know, for medical reasons. So, uh, you know, all this money is being spent, you know, to, at this point, to start flying physicians in, you know, every 60 to 90 days to perform some type of procedure, um, because, uh, you know, because they uh, just won't allow them to come, you know, come to the U.S. It's, uh, it's, it's truly strange, but this is, uh, you know, the pace that, well, that, you know, that's continuing to go. You know, at this point we have 160 there. There's supposed to be two prisoners actually being released tomorrow, by the way. Yeah. That's the news uh, I saw hearing. a couple, as you mentioned, a couple were let go, uh, sent back to Algeria. Or yeah. To Algeria. The I don't last, know about back to, but to Algeria. Yeah, um, the last uh, Sudanese, you know, prisoners there are supposed to be released tomorrow. So that will bring it down to 158. And, well, I'm sure you're uh, aware the uh, the first commander, the Marine uh, yeah. officer who was, uh, I forget if he was a general or corporal or captain or whatever, but lieutenant. Some. Anyway, uh, he's come out against it, and he was on CNN actually just before the show uh, saying that he knew then that a lot of these people did not deserve to be there at all in the first place. And that is the consensus now, and they still won't finish closing it down and letting the innocent go free and figuring out a way to convict the guilty in a federal court, which ought to be easy enough anyway. I mean, come on, all they got to do is show up to get a conviction against Ramsey right. Ben Al-Sheib. So anyway, um, there's the consensus as you're reporting here. Uh, the admiral who's in charge now, he agrees <laughs> with everybody says they want to close it, and yet here we are still. But at least we got you to read. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. That's Jason Leopold, everybody. America.aljazeera.com for his latest series from his trip to Guantanamo Bay.
Hey, Al Scott here for MyHeroesThink.com. They sell beautiful 7-inch busts of libertarian heroes Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Ron Paul, and Harry Brown. I've got the Harry Brown one on the bookshelf now. Makes me smile every time it catches my eye. These finely crafted statues from MyHeroesThink.com make excellent decorations for your desktop at work, bookends for your shelves, or gifts for that special individualist in your life. They're also all available in colors now, too. Of course, gold, silver, or bronze. Coming soon, Hayek, Hazlitt, Carlin. Use promo code Scott Horton and save $5 at MyHeroesThink.com. Hey, Al Scott here. Ever wanted to help support the show and own silver at the same time? Well, a friend of mine, libertarian activist Arlo Pignati, has invented the alternative currency with the most promise of them all. QR Silver Commodity Discs. The first ever QR code one-ounce silver pieces. Just scan the back of one with your phone and get the instant spot price. They're perfect for saving or spending at the market. And anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one. That's scotthorton.org slash donate. And if you'd like to learn and order more, send them a message at commoditydiscs.com or check them out on Facebook at slash commoditydiscs. And thanks. Why does the U.S. support the tortured dictatorship in Egypt? Because that's what Israel wants. Why can't America make peace with Iran? Because that's not what Israel wants. And why do we veto every attempt to shut down illegal settlements on the West Bank? Because it's what Israel wants. Seeing a pattern here? Sick of it yet? It's time to put America first. Support the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org and push back against the Israel lobby and their sock puppets in Washington, D.C. That's councilforthenationalinterest.org. Hey, Al Scott Horton here for The Future Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation. As you may already be aware, Jacob Hornberger, Sheldon Richmond, and James Bovard are awesome. They're also in every issue of The Future Freedom, and they're joined by others of the best of the libertarian movement. People like Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, Lawrence Vance, Joe Stromberg, and many more. Even me. Sign up for The Future Freedom at fff.org slash subscribe. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 to read it online. That's The Future Freedom, edited by Sheldon Richmond at fff.org slash subscribe. And tell me heard it here oh man i'm late sure hope i can make my flight stand there me i am standing here come here okay hands up turn around oh easy into the scanner Ooh, what's this in your pants hey slow down it's just my hold it right there your wallet has tripped the metal detector what's this the bill of rights that's right It's just a harmless stainless steel business card sized copy of the Bill of Rights from SecurityEdition.com. Therefore exposing the TSA as a bunch of liberty destroying goons who've never protected anyone from anything. Sir, now give me back my wallet and get out of my way. Got a plane to catch. Have a nice day. Play a leading role in the security theater with the Bill of Rights Security Edition from SecurityEdition.com. It's the size of a business card, so it fits right in your wallet, and it's guaranteed to trip the metal detectors wherever the police state goes. That's securityedition.com. And don't forget their great Fourth Amendment socks. Hey guys, I got his laptop. 